So my name is Karen Shimada, and I'm the director of the Oregon Oral Health Coalition, and I'm biased when I say they saved the best to last, because I'm really excited about the panel that you're going to be sharing um, this in the next hour. Uh, we're really building on what Dr. Jones set the stage for this morning. How do you move from I to we? And how do you build a healthy community? It's not just whether I'm healthy and I have access to care and my quality of care is good, but it's what the, just, the panel that just spoke um, addressed also. Healthy community means all of us are heard, all of us are asked for our opinion, we're included in the conversation, where power is shared with us to help determine some of the solutions to some of the issues, and there's that terrible old saying that says if you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem, but what if you're defined as the problem and you're not asked to be part of the solution, you're not given a voice. So part of this panel today is to share with you some of the strategies for community engagement in, in influencing policy and some of the, um, the ways that our esteemed panelists today work with their organizations to really get that community voice out there. Because this isn't about doing unto, this is about coming from within and up and creating change and creating policies that will create healthy communities. So first of all, I'd like to introduce my panelists. Um, the first is Edna Niamu. Edna is the Deputy Director for the Oregon Community Health Workers Association. She did her MS in Global Health, and she's a certified community health worker in the state of Oregon. Edna is also a member of the Traditional Health Worker Commission under the OHA Office of Equity and Inclusion. She speaks three languages, Swahili, Maasai, and English, and does Swahili language uh, interpretation. Uh, Edna is also on the board of We Can Do Better. Next is Erin Scholten. Erin is the Health Promotion Disease Prevention Program Administrator, long title, for Klamath County Public Health. She's also co-chair of the Healthy Klamath Coalition. In these roles, Erin manages several grant-funded programs, coordinates the health community, uh, community health assessment, and works with community partners to implement policy. She's the chair of the Klamath Basin Oral Health Coalition, yay, and also helps facilitate the entry that named Klamath Falls a winner of the 2018 Robert Wood Johnson Culture of Health Award. And then my third panelist is Annie Valtierra Sanchez. Annie has a bachelor's degree and is the bilingual equity coordinator for the Southern Oregon Health E, and the region, which is the regional health equity coalition in Southern Oregon. Her degree is in sociology and anthropology from Southern Oregon University, and she also holds a certificate of applied research. Through her many years of community involvement and her academic coursework, Annie's gained a more complete understanding of how social determinants affect health equity. So thank you for welcoming us here. We're really excited to close out the day. Thank you. And we really, we, we talked as a group at lunch, and we really loved the way the first panel had a little bit of a moment to say, who am I and why am I here? So we thought we'd also start with that. And um, I'll just say my name is Karen Shimada, and I am um, here because for some reason, somehow, the mouth isn't really considered part of the body. And if you're gonna have a voice, it starts with having a mouth. It comes from the mouth. So part of what I'm about and what our organization is about is really not just giving a voice, you know, uh, metaphorically, but also making sure that the mouth is included as part of overall health for all Oregonians. Yes. Hello again. So as Karen introduced myself, I am Edna Nyamu, and uh, thank you actually everyone for being here until this time. We appreciate that you, you're still hanging here. So um, I'm originally from Tanzania, and uh, usually people, when I meet them, they say, so what brought you here? And I just want to say to everyone that is not like a very polite way to ask someone. There's a way to say, I know some people say um, the polite way, uh, you have a beautiful accent, where are you from? That's better than just to say, what brought you here? So to answer that question, I came here because I wanted to go to school. And then I met my husband, we stayed here, so we are still here for many years. Um, I am a community health worker certified by the state. I like to say that I'm certified by the state, it just sounds good. Um, 
and I will, <laughs> yes, um, I work with different communities uh, as a uh, deputy director, as Karen already said. Uh, we, our organization is located in Northeast Portland, uh, and I really enjoy what I'm doing. I love it. Uh, it's a job that it goes beyond your hours. It's not just eight to five. You work on weekend, but I love it. So that's for about me. Great, thank you. Okay, so I am not an Oregon native. Um, I get the same question. Well. What brought you to Oregon? Um, I call Missouri home, but I moved out here for my specific job at the health department. Um, it really aligned my interest as far as health promotion programming. Um, my background, um, both of my degrees are in public health, but I call it my public health sandwich because in between I spent seven years in the Army. Um, so it was really interesting to see how health and wellness played out in the Army um, and the motivations behind that compared to the motivations behind the work we do today. Um, and just as I've, I've always been interested in population health, even growing up in junior high and high school before I even knew what it was, I had that interest in just really seeing and learning um, the differences, seeing it play out in my family as far as the different health outcomes and the different birth outcomes for some family members that have um, completed high school and those that have not and different factors going to prison and how that's affected them and having, um, as a result, premature death. So just in my personal life, um, been impacted by losing people to um, unintentional injury death, suicide death, and then just premature death from he poor health outcomes. So it's been, um, it's rewarding to help raise that awareness and educate people on the, the root causes of that and work to address that to hopefully impact everyone on a greater level. Hello, Annie Valteria Sanchez, as I was introduced. Um, what brought me here? I originally was born in Mexico City, so I'm an immigrant, uh, now a US citizen. And the work that I'm doing right now, it's, uh, you know, I'm doing what I, you know, my discipline, um, you know, wh where my heart is. So as a sociologist and anthropologist, looking at, you know, how groups and, and society operate, what moves them, what, you know, um, we're always changing. I wouldn't say evolving, because we're always changing, and I don't know if it's morphine or what do you call it. And then anthropology, the study of cultures. And um, I, I think we still have a, you know, in, in the US, we still have, a, especially right now, a really hard time grasping the, the concept that we're not monocultural. We're not a monoculture, so um, being able to look at other cultures with curiosity and 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 learn from you know th there are differences. Um, so in doing equity, um, obviously, you know that's one thing for um, the work that I'm doing in equity. That's something that I feel strongly about. Trying to find representation for communities of color, and as an immigrant. Um, have experienced racism, and I will agree with Dr. Jones that we can do equity if we are not talking about um, anti-racism work. So that's where I feel strongly about, um, and you know, it, it's where. And so, in doing health equity, we also look at social determinants of health, and that's everything, right? Education, transportation. So. Again, it's, this is where we live. Um, our communities are all integrated um, or connected somehow. Uh, we wish we, they were more integrated and that we could make better use of our resources so that we can diminish those disparities. So that's a goal, um, wishful thinking. Thank you. Great, thank you. So the format for our panel discussion is each of the panelists will introduce their organization and how they're organizing, doing community organizing for equity, some of their initiatives and some of the successes and the strategies that they're employing. At the end of the introductions then, we um, have some questions that the We Can Do Better committee help uh, formulate to spark some conversation and then time for question and answers. So let's start with um, Edna. Okay, so uh, how many of you are familiar with the Oregon Community Health Workers Association? Wonderful. 
So I'll be saying Ochoa. I don't have to say the whole thing again. <laughs> <laughs> so Ochoa is a, uh, our mission is to uh, empower, uh, unify the voices of community health workers and our community at the same time we want to empower communities. So the organization is young, started 2011, but for the work that we've done so far, it looks like it's a mighty organization. Actually, when I started with uh, working for Ocho, we are only two staff, and this is a statewide organization, and we were able to do a lot of things. So this organization is um, really focused on the voices of community health workers and also to unify their voices and bring policies at the table at the same time, we work very hard with uh, marginalized communities, people of color, to make sure we are reaching out to people who are really uh, experiencing uh, health disparities. Uh, this organization is uh, really run and led by community health workers. We have 97% of board members are community health workers, so that's a really good job that we are doing. Because we want to make sure board members are not just from different places, but they come from those communities that they represent. Uh, another thing about the organization uh, is the membership organization. We want to make sure uh, the voices of those who are members uh, get the, la the first place. And we do a lot of other things to prioritize those things, including uh, our annual conference that we do annually. Uh, and members can come to the conference for two days for free. Uh, so they will, we'll talk more about what we do with our organization uh, as we continue with uh, some of the questions. Okay, so like we said before, um, I'm from Klamath County, Oregon. Klamath County is named after the Klamath tribes who have lived in the Klamath River Basin region since time immemorial. And this is a picture. It is a beautiful place to live. We are a small um, rural community in southern, southern Oregon. Our county borders Northern California, but please come visit us. Um, one of the things we're, I'm going to talk about is our journey to building a culture of health. Um, in 2012, um, our community found ourselves at the bottom of the county health rankings, 36 out of 36. And we haven't made a lot of progress in the numbers, but that's not why we do the work we do. Um, there's been a little bit of fluctuation. But at that time in 2012, a lot of community members rallied and said, we have to do something about this. What can we do? organized, um, brought together many different sectors, and it started out as the he Healthy Active Klamath and has morphed into Healthy Klamath, um, the coalition, and that's where we started with our first community health assessment in 2012, and then our first community health improvement plan. Um, so this year we're finishing up our third iteration for the 2018 community health assessment. But from that, our community brought in um, the Blue Zones Project. We were the first um, Blue Zones Project demonstration community in the state of Oregon, and that really helped us give us the structure to make policy and systems changes. And we have city council members, county commissioners involved in that, and different leadership from our healthcare organizations. It's really been instrumental in making some of the changes that have led to us um, becoming a Culture of Health Prize winner. So these are the six prize criteria. Um, what we learned throughout this process is we weren't competing against anyone else. About 200 entries um, nationwide started um, a little over a year ago now, so in the fall of 2017, and it was an almost year-long process of submitting two essays, a community video, doing a site visit, and a community tour um, describing how well you met these prize criteria. And one of the, the unique things about Oregon is I think we could all meet these prize criteria. If you look at this list using evidence-based programming, um, making sustainable changes, focusing on health equity as a whole in Oregon, the work we do, that's what we emphasize. So I think anyone can win the prize. Um, we are very proud to say we are one of four winners nationwide this year. We were the only rural jurisdiction and also the only um, jurisdiction this year that was able to feature work from our tribal partners. Um, the other communities were San Antonio, Texas, Cicero, Illinois, outside of Chicago, and the historic town of Eatonville in Florida, right outside of Orlando. And we really were able to find the commonalities 
like we're all working on um, with our law enforcement and our mental health agencies um, to prevent some incarceration that may be a result of a mental health issue. Um, and then working on increasing career technical education, increasing school graduation rates. Um, but I wanted to focus today, we're gonna talk a lot about how we're building partnerships um, for health equity. And then on this slide, this is just showing um, a lot of our different partnerships. We have a summer park and play program where it's our summer meal program. Um, our partnerships with our Klamath Tribal Health and Family um, Services to pass tobacco policy, to do the Klamath Regional Health Equity Coalition and the Chilliquin First Coalition, um, getting the Blue Zones Project, changing the environment in stores, workplaces, and things like that. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that, but we're kind of the underdog. If Klamath, who's ranked 36 or 35, whatever year it is, can win this prize, um, and it's what we're doing to impact the health rankings. It's not because we're at the top of the health rankings, and we've come together across many different sectors in our community to make a committed effort to improve health where we live, learn, work, and play. And that's how we work on and are building a culture of health in our community. So I'm with the Southern Oregon Health Equity Coalition. I'm the equity coordinator and our mission is to advance equity through looking at the social determinants of health. And the populations that we prioritize are listed, racial, ethnic minorities, people with disabilities, gender and sexual minorities, and low income individuals. And um, we, you know, we, when we're putting together our work plans and our priorities and we're, you know, we're trying to figure out how to make the most out of it, right? We know that there's uh, some intersectionality between race and disability and um, race and income. And so it's, um, it's not easy. <laughs> So in looking at how to create more community engagement, um, if we really wanna serve um, populations that are underrepresented, we need to have their input. And usually, you know, there's the approach of community engagement where it's more passive. Um, you can throw out some surveys, try to collect some data, and try to figure out how to help the community. Uh, we've been working to move more towards that more proactive approach where we are wanting to involve community members in decision making and think it's more um, productive that way, more um, proactive. Uh, we can, you know, my approach um, since I've been working with the coalition is that we don't do the work for the community. We want to work and support them. We want to work alongside of them and, and support them as much as we can. And the other thing is that when we think of, you know, I, and I have used the word empowerment, I think our communities already have a power. There are communities, especially communities of color and, and people living with disabilities, they have the resiliency to keep going, get up every day, do things. We just need to support and encourage that they can have some um, self-agency. And in the end, it's not just like the self-agency, right? We live in a community, we should be able to look out for each other and support each other. So with that, our community engagement goals have been to build um, health equity advocates, um, providing more education, leadership, uh, opportunities where they can learn how to advocate for themselves. Um, right now we have, uh, I have a colleague who uh, has been doing policy and advocacy work, and we were able to do a couple of um, advocacy trainings with people in the community. And so that's been really um, eye-opening for them because they see the process of thinking how they can get the results that they're looking for. Um, and in doing that, that's the second goal, um, leveraging collective impact, right? If you have an individual trying to advocate for themselves, it's going to look very different than if you have a, a, a community who is coming together and supporting each other and creating more visibility and creating more of a voice. So that's um, more impactful for decision makers, we're hoping, and even for themselves to know that there's other people in the community who 
stand with them. And the third goal is to increase meaningful community input in organizational decision making. Uh, we've, been, been, we've been talking about having community members be part of the decision making in our committees for the coalition, but also for them to be involved in, in their communities, whether it is you know, supporting for us, advocating um, for a cause, or even joining any other committee in their community. Um, kind of having a seat at the table, right? Being able to, and it's not easy when, you know, I'm looking around the room and even being here, um, some of us can do that more easily. We can speak in a meeting, we can um, advocate for ourselves or give ideas or give input, even if, you know, somebody turns it down. Um, it's a little bit harder for somebody who's not used to being in those spaces, so, that's something that I'm striving with my colleague to create more advocacy with, within our communities and so that they can have um, a chance of being able to impact uh, those conversations happening um, in the tables where decisions are being made. So the ultimate goal, um, and I said earlier, wishful thinking is a creating collective impact, right, where we not only have the community at the table, but we have all the different um, organizations, agencies that actually have a say um, in creating some systems change and policy changes. And with that, it's, it's a lot of work, creating um, a collective voice and a collective way of thinking. And the way that we've been working is by having different sectors represented in our steering committee, and trying to look at uh, our priorities through an equity lens. And people are at different levels um, on, in their equity journey, so sometimes it's a little bit more challenging. Um, there's people who are ready to go and, and they take back equity work to their organizations, some bring it back and challenge you know, the rest of the group. Um, but it's not always easy. And right now, the um, co-chairs that we have in our steering committee, they have made it very clear that, you know, our allegiance is to the community. We want to um, be able to support them. We want to hear them. We, wanna, we want them, you know, at the table. And that's who they want to focus on, which is really great. Um, so how does community engagement look, for, uh, look like for us? Uh, so we have hosted listening sessions, you know, trying to get some some input. Uh, we can't just come and say, we're gonna give you this, or we think, or we heard, or we're looking at data. Um, and we have, you know, done that. The data tells us this, what do you think? Is this how you see it? Um, but we have also hosted listening sessions where we wanna know how things are for them in the community. And surprisingly, sometimes it's something else, you know, um, in the case of my community engagement work, it has been racism that has surfaced as like a priority and a high stress um, issue for communities of color. Uh, we have done the advocacy trainings, as I mentioned, we've done that with youth in um, communities of color, adults. Um, and in doing that, we want them to be able to frame the problem that they're experiencing and put it in a context that makes sense to them, right? We can't tell them you have to do it this way or it's not gonna work because if it doesn't feel right for them, then it's not, they're not gonna be committed to um, the work or it's not gonna feel right for them. And in that, we also um, are able to develop shared goals. You know, are things aligned where we wanna be going and allowing community members to also lead us? And what are the objectives, right? We can't just go do work and, and think, oh, we're done. Um, equity work is hard equity work is ongoing, so, you know, you have to have some steps and some, and some um, milestones that you feel like you are moving somewhere or else it can be very discouraging. Um, and in doing the advocacy training, uh, the community members have learned to compile their, their own thoughts and their own uh, needs to be able to ask decision makers what they're needing and being able to create a timeline, right? And in doing that, they have learned to think forward and say, well, things are not gonna happen tomorrow. It might take months, it might take years. 
and being able to look at a timeline and also what resources are needed and able to create the outcomes that they're looking for, uh, forward to. And then um, follow up. You can't just go talk to, um, they have learned, you can't just talk to decision makers um, and think that they listen and they nodded or they said, oh yeah, we get it, we're working on it. Um, you have to follow up. And, and as decision makers, I think that's the right thing to do also. Uh, we can talk about community and not really take that into account and not be intentional about it. So that's where we are. Thank you. Thank you. So part of changing this conversation uh, that Dr. Jones kind of introduced us to today, to moving from the I to the we, to value everyone in the community and their voice, to ask, to listen, to learn, what does it mean to be healthy to diverse communities? What does it mean not just to eliminate disparities, but also to hold all people as valued and an important part of a lineage of stories? So the next question to our panelists is, how can the community's voice and their lived experiences help influence policy? Okay, so the good thing of presenting at the end of the day is like everything has already been said in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> but repetition is good. So we'll keep repeating and that's the way sometimes we have to hear. I know that uh, sometimes when people say like, we talk about racism too much, I think we'll keep saying that until there's time we don't say it anymore because we don't need to. So we'll keep repeating. Uh, to answer the question is, um, I go right to where, why the reason why Ocho was, uh, started at the beginning. What was the reason to start it? Uh, and I want to say just for when I ask about how many knows about community health workers, uh, how many of you know about who are community health workers? Oh, wow, good. So if you did not raise your hands, uh, community health workers are people from the community, but they are carefully chosen people. So not everyone can say, oh, I am a community health worker. Uh, you have to be trusted member of that community. You understand the culture of the community. You, are, you know the, the ins and outs, the problems and the success of the community. So if you don't just say I'm a community health worker, but you really you are not connected to that community. You have to be able to speak the language. It doesn't mean like the language language, but you really understand what's going on. So those are the community health workers. The key word, you have to be trusted member of the community. So Ochoa uh, was created by following other policies. We, it was not just one person like decided, okay, this is what I want to do. There were key people who said, yes, we need to have the policy, we need to have an association where community health workers can be under one umbrella, where we can put their, their voices together. So how do we influence policy? It has to come from the community. The community have to believe on what they want to do and what, why they want to do that. So community need to have a unified voice and also they have to agree on the issue that they want to work on as a community. We just don't take away someone's lived experience. Because sometimes you can just make changes, but someone's life or lived experience, it's hard to change. And those are the people that we need to take their stories really and listen, and they'll be able to testify whether it's in Salem and make those changes. It can be a good uh, life experience, so it can be a really terrible one, but then there is some good things about it. So we need to listen to us and then take those to the policymakers, speak to the allies, speak to our policy, our, our policymakers again, uh, our allies and other supporters. We have to bring the issues back to the people that we know they will be supporting us. Also, um, Ochoa, as an organization, we work with community health workers where we provide policy training 101. This is to uh, bring to the communities around the state like before we can go to community health workers, if someone tells me, oh, call your representative, I don't know what I'm calling, what am I saying? So I need to be prepared to do that. Or write a letter to your representative. I need to know how can I address that. Or go to Salem and, and testify. How can I do that? So we provide this policy training 101 is getting ideas or issue from the table all the way to become a law. How do we transform ideas to become laws? So we train CHWs to be prepared so if we say they had, we have a policy we want to talk about, they are ready to go to Salem and speak out. So uh, we also uh, sharing personal stories again, whether it's a success story or it's not, we can make a big impact influencing policy. 
Let me also say as community voices have to be genuine, you have to be honest with your story. Uh, and there have to be a trust relationship or partnership in a space where community members can feel really comfortable to speak, especially when we're looking at the environment that we have not right now. People have a lot to say, but if we don't feel comfortable, I'm, a, I'm an immigrant. I have to be careful how what I say, because any time if I do something wrong, I can be just sent back to Tanzania. So we have to feel to be in a space where we are comfortable to speak and prepare that space. We usually use what we say, popular education, for people who know that, or people education. You give people space to be able to speak and believe that everyone in that space has something to share. So give them the space. And that way, as Ochoa, we really supported. We had a house bill that started way back, uh, 36, 34 or 7 house bill. And that was helping to, to make Ochoa be what we can do. So bills have to come, whether it's a house bill or issue, or we're supporting other issues from other organizations. We have to be able to understand what's going on. We have to be at the table where people are doing those things. Sometimes we just get, to me, it's like being at the table is not enough. If you go there and just sit there, yes, you just brought the food and you eat, but you don't know who prepared and how it was prepared. I want to be like part of the agenda. How many minutes do I get in that agenda? Or to go beyond that. Go to the kitchen, make sure what spices did they put to the food. <laughs> so that I'm not just getting the food. Yes, it tastes good, it smells good, but I really don't know what they put in there. So we need to know <laughs> behind the agenda what am I getting and what are they getting because always there is something. They come to community health workers and they want us and they now it's like there. We are the really hot thing in, in town, community health workers. But what are we gaining and what are the other people gaining from us? So we just have to really talk to community health workers and always see like we have to start from the grassroots. Sometimes things are coming all the way up there, but really community members have to be part of that. In Klamath, um, some of our policy changes are still top down, um, but there's a lot of in responsive programs. So we have something happen, we implement a program or do some sort of intervention. Um, where we've been successful with our tobacco retail licensing initiative that we passed at the county level and then the city of Klamath Falls in 2017 was incorporating the youth voice. We were able to find common ground um, to protect our youth. We were able to have youth come in and give public testimony of how they're effective, see, affected seeing their peers, being able to purchase tobacco products, and then also hearing from former smokers. Um, those were our two most powerful things to make a difference in passing that policy. Um, and then another piece for lived experience, when we started, um, well, and this actually started before I got to the community, the Klamath Regional Health Equity Coalition, um, one of the primary partners was Klamath Tribal Health and Family Services. And their first project they worked on for several years is to do a social exclusion simulation focused on a tribal population. And that's the first of its kind using that focus. So for example, um, if a tribal member has, uh, is visiting a child that was taken away by DHS, but there's other issues of understanding the culture or if that person was late to the, um, to the appointment because maybe they didn't have a ride or just something else was a barrier to getting to that appointment on time, then they weren't able to see their child. So that was something that was featured during the social exclusion simulation and they were able to bring um, elected officials, law enforcement, community partners to participate into that in that community, um, in that simulation. And that was really foundational for building the partnerships in 2016 that have really been instrumental um, to this day. So last year in the spring, we um, back to back in one of our outlying communities um, had two shooting deaths. And it really caught everyone off guard. It wasn't a regular thing. You don't want it to be a regular thing. So the community mobilized, tribal health led that initiative and said, hey, what's going on? This is a problem. They called in SAMHSA for technical assistance and held what was called a gathering of Native Americans um, and went door to door talking to the community members. The district attorney was there, the tribal chairman, law enforcement, partners from the school districts were there um, mobilize and say, hey, what can we do to address this issue? This is our community. We have pride in it. We don't want these issues happening here. Um, and if it wasn't for building those relationships two, three years prior, 
we wouldn't have been at that position to bring out together those community partners, um, bring them into the community and have that level of trust in order to do that exercise, or not even the exercise, that event. And now we're moving on to bringing SAMHSA back for technical assistance training so they can continue um, doing those types of events. Um, so I'll share a couple of examples how we've been able to support voice and lived experience. So last year, there was the mandatory reporting um, bill, or is it measure? Um, and uh, a couple of people from our um, organization, members of our organization working in our reproductive and sexual health uh, work group said, well, you know, we're looking at this, how it affects um, youth and even people who work in the health settings, you know, are they supposed to, and in school settings also, are they supposed to report or not, or how do they make the decision if it's mandatory and then they go case by case. So they decided, well, we need to hear from the youth. And so they set out to conduct some focus groups and to their surprise, some youth were saying, so what are you doing with this? And, and, you know, and they're like, well, this is happening. And they're like, yeah, we are aware. We want to talk to the representatives. And so um, that was a way of giving them a voice and also um, being able to speak from those who are impacted, in this case, youth, who many times we can oversee and try to make decisions for them. Um, they were able to talk to a representative and share their own experience, how it will affect them if, you know, that was something that they were going through. And in this case, um, the group of uh, students who presented to the representative were some students of color, some who identified as LGBTQ. So it was a good representation of what our youth looks like and how they're affected. So that was a great way of, um, building some capacity. So before even doing, you know, meeting with that representative, uh, we were able to do an advocacy training with them. So they knew how to, you know, like Edna was saying, you can't just sit them at the table. They have to know how things work and how things move. And, um, and they were just natural. So that was pretty amazing that, you know, some people are ready. And like I said, it's not about us empowering them. The power is already there. It's just, um, teaching them, right, or showing them the way or the different ways that things can work, and when we don't know, we don't know. Um, another example, um, and so in, in that I think is also building trust. Uh, if people know who you are, the work that you're doing in the community, they're more likely to trust you and, and know that you have the best intention for them. And with that, I had a group of um, parents um, who are parents of students of color and came to me and said, you know, we know you're doing equity and um, this, these are some issues that we're dealing with and we need some help. So we also did an advocacy training with them and they were able to present their issues that they were um, experiencing and they were able to voice. So they um, held a meeting with decision makers and they were able to facilitate it um, they each took turns, you know, some of them telling their, their own experience and being able to address the issues that they wanted, where they wanted to see change. So that was really um, good to see that, you know, one thing is you have to build trust with the community and then being able to hear from them what is it that they need. They don't need you, you know, many times they don't need you to speak for them. Um, there's times when we do need to um, figure out the ways that facilitate a, a meeting with decision makers or a, how to um, kind of maneuver through the systems that are in place. Um, and I think after all that, the whole thing is about building capacity in the community, right? If more communities are able to advocate for themselves, then we're able to learn from each other and also create a more um, collective uh, impact in, in our communities because when some of these parents came and, and shared their stories, some of, them, some of them had already, you know, gone and talked to somebody else and went up the, the ladder of like decision makers and they felt that they were being dismissed. 
But when they came together, they had more of a collective voice and they could you know, support each other and they had more visibility and they felt more supported um, and knowing that they were not alone. So being able to create that voice and, and kind of a shared experience, even though it was different for everyone. So that's, um, that's probably like the reward you know, of doing equity work. And I think um, the main thing is that if you are doing equity work is you're centering the people who are underrepresented. I, if we keep centering uh, people who are in power or the system, we're just um, perpetuating the system of power that creates the inequities that a lot of us live under. Thank you. Part of the analogy this morning about the restaurant, you know, if you're kind of in there, you don't really know what's going on on the outside. Um, and the, uh, the question about why should the red flowers share? So the next question that we have for the panelists is how do you respond to people in your community who historically have benefited from in inequities and feel creating equity takes away from them? I start. Um, I read that question and I just laughed because that's so, I thought, Really, don't be silly. Um, <laughs> uh, creating equity is not taking anything from you or it's not taking your luxuries away from you. Uh, actually, um, pay, you are paying for it without even knowing. For example, if someone does not have health insurance and the only way they know to get their treatment is going through the emergency room, who is paying for, it, for that? Our taxpayers, we pay for it. We can look at the schools in the neighborhood. There are schools that, yes, they get all the resources they need. Some schools, that don't, they don't get that much. So who is most likely to graduate from high school? And who is most likely to go to jail? Where is the problem? Who is paying for it? So I think we just have to look at the big picture, like Dr. Jones said. Some changes you can make it and, and think of 10 years or even five years uh, to benefit from that. So. I know it, 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 it's hard if you're holding something and it's yours to see like, oh, if I share, it's going to go, I, I'm losing something out of that. But if you look at the big picture, it's not like that. We have to share uh, our resources without feeling like, oh, if I give up, I'm going to lose my privilege. In a way, for me, I see uh, you're not even losing and I'm not like taking it from you. Probably you took it from me. So let's just get it back and share it. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, I, I have, I have, I have my, I have my friend Nigerians, and, and they were good friends. This is a joke, but they say we are not stealing from Americans. We are just taking back what they've taken from us. <laughs> so uh, I think it's very important that we we look at the whole picture and see that it's not like you are giving away what you have, but really we are we are doing it so that we can all benefit in our generations to come. They can see, okay, those who are here, they did a good job. Instead of putting a lot of money, okay, this is my house, I'm putting this expensive wall, I don't want to see my neighbor. It costs you money, and then you're always just trying to be tied on yourself. I don't think that's a neighborhood I want to be with fences and, and no friend neighborhood. Let's think of in different ways so that we can all be able to share and be friends in a community that we support each other. It's not like you're losing your privileges. Hmm. In our community, ours is similar where we can talk about there's enough to go around. Someone having a high school education doesn't take away from you. Um, or for like our policymakers, we find what are they interested in? They're interested in improving the economy. So then we talk about how having given everyone education helps develop a better workforce, making sure everyone has health care and how that ties to the um, better workforce. Um, last year, we've encountered an issue where there's a a young, motivated um, musician in our community that started a nonprofit to use rap to influence the most at-risk youth in our community, and then eventually having that investment in those youth will turn around and have a turnaround in their grades and um, really build a community for them, but it, the model's based off of lived experience where this person that started this has been in prison. He has tattoos on his face. His mentors have facial piercings. They're a great group, but their heart is there. And as they've been working in the community with our healthcare partners, um, they were receiving pushback and bias. And 
there's a few of us that are involved in the coalition that we've had to go, and we didn't mind, we had to go advocate on their behalf. So someone was a board, uh, on a board of one of the agencies that was pushing back and had to go talk to the CEO, had to go talk to, use their relationships to advocate on behalf of, of this person. Um, and it was just really frustrating for us of just having the community to not understand the whole point of the peer support model is this is live ex lived experience just because they don't look like you or you don't like the way they look coming to a meeting. Um, there's such value and acknowledging those at risk youth need this program. Um, so we, got, we continue the advocacy on behalf of this organization, bringing them along to our coalition meeting. Be like, okay, well, you know what? We're gonna put you on the agenda and give you a, um, help you speak and share your voice with our community partners um, and come alongside of you. So when I've got this great relationship with this partner, but they're pushing back against you, um, we can help hopefully bridge that gap and further their work. Um, and I just said it in the last question that, you know, um, anytime we're centering um, those in power, then, and those who already have privilege, then we're perpetuating the structural um, racism in the system. So we have to go back to that all the time. So thank you. Great. Okay, our last question, and then we want to have a chance for you to ask our panelists some questions um, that may have arisen during this presentation. Um, we're looking at successful strategies. We want to end the day with, okay, part of the we can do better challenge is when you leave here, how are you going to take action? What did you hear that worked? What strategies from these different organizations and these different communities do you feel you can utilize or employ in the work that you're doing? So this question has to do with how have partnerships been formed in your community for, ag for agencies and underrepresented uh, um, communities to work together? Some of this has been addressed in the previous questions, but I think this real one is getting at how do you create a space, for a, for a safe space, for communities that haven't had a voice, who are underrepresented, to really come together to create change? Um, so for us as an organization, we, we are really good at that. I'm not trying to brag. We are, we are good at... Uh, creating space for community health workers and community members. We know the this, this style of making everyone feel comfortable uh, to speak up where we use the popular education. We have some games that we start with so people can relax and really be able to build that trust. So I have like bullet points by building trust and I'm, say, I'm saying trust in capital letters, that has to be there. Otherwise people will not open up for you. They will not want, you can say whatever you want to say but they will not take anything into action. Also by understanding that the underrepresented represented communities have some similar issues, if not all. So knowing who is in the room and understanding like we all have problems, we all have these issues, they are similar. Maybe we can be different in what is the, our priority and how do we want to go through that problem. But if we all sit there on the table, the issues are really housing, unemployment, education, racism, it's all there. It, we suffer as an, uh, community, uh, communities and uh, people of color. Also by recognizing that partnership with each other is better than working alone. We know in the community there is no one who can succeed by just doing the work by yourself. There are people who just want to go solo and try to do that. It's really challenging. And somewhere you're going to need your partners and your allies and supporters, and you need to be at the table where you can sell your idea. So having similar agenda, ideas and issues, or those problems that we all share, it makes sense to collaborate and having the voice to tackle the issues together. Whether it's a policy issues or working together to address social determinants of health and equities as partners. Ocho is a good example of how we partner with others, uh, and especially small organizations, when we received a um, grant. And I have to say thank you to HealthShare of Oregon for understanding what we are doing, the work of community health workers, and supporting us with not only one million, not two million, but three million. So we are able, yes, thank you, HealthShare. Um, and the other, other organizations and other funders who are, are really working with us really well. We work very well with the county. They are also supporting us. We work well with health systems, Kaiser, Providence. We work together in the state as well. 
So we are able to be able to, with Orchard Grill receiving the money from us, we already built the trust in, with our community-based organization. We send that money. It's not just sitting at Ochoa, but we have to build Ochoa's infrastructure first in order to go out and support our small community-based organization. So we are really able to do that by building that trust, and we already have it, and understanding like all these communities, especially we work with cultural specific communities. So whether it's African, African-American, Latino, Asians, we go very specific. That way we know it's working. And then we find those community health workers in those communities to do the work. So it's, not, it's very hard, I can do it, but it's very challenging if I'm going to work with a community of micronations. I can do it, but you take time for them to trust me and to do that work. If I have a community health workers from Micronesia community, much easier. They already have that trust and relationship. So it will make much the work go quickly and it probably even less costing. So partnership and trust does not happen overnight. We know that. We have to build that trust. Uh, and when you have it, everything else just fall in place. So we have to have that. One of the benefits of living in a fairly small community is all the same people are in all of the different coalitions. So that really helps us um, connect our work. But we work on aligning our priorities so we can consolidate our resources, um, connecting us to other people working on something similar. So if one of us is at a coalition meeting saying, oh, well, you need to call this person because they're working on this, you need to connect the work um, with our oral health coalition. It took a little while, but we're like, well, we need the chair of the education coalition and this coalition as well because there's so much crossover. Um, right now we're kind of still lacking in community engagement, but we do have our trusted partners representing each community that if we are doing something, we go talk to that specific person, like the co-chair of the Hispanic Advisory Board and say, okay, we're doing this policy. What are some considerations we need to have? And then our newspaper is really good um, on focusing on health and issues like that. So a lady started a neighborhood association in one of our um, most impoverished neighborhoods. So we read her story, called her up, and I said, how can we work with you? How can we support you? How can we build um, a relationship to better impact that community? So just alignment and just connecting each other and connecting our resources. Uh, for us, we our steering committee is made up of um, the goal is at least 51% um, people of color. And we are realizing that not all of them are, and right now I think it's close to like 80% people of color. Um, but realize that not all of them, um, even though they have some lived experience, they're not necessarily impacted um, community members because they, they are professionals. But that's the other plus that we have um, a representation of uh, cross-sectoral um, representation in our board. Uh, I mean, in our steering committee. So we have people from like law enforcement, um, nonprofits, education, K, K through 12, uh, K through 12 um, higher ed, uh, medical clinics. So looking at all the different, you know, if we wanna impact the social determinants of health, we wanna look at all of it from the different sectors and being able to connect and see how it looks like for each sector. And the other thing is also um, just even connecting with the community members. Um, Tuesday, we had a community engagement work group meeting and three of our steering committee members were there. So it was really impactful for them to hear the stories and, and what's going on in the, with them in, in their communities. And I think it just kind of fuels um, those in leadership to you know, um, uphold those voices and, and those concerns. So creating a cross-sectoral and also having the professionals and the community members um, work together and being able to look at everything through an equity lens. We really appreciate you being here. Thanks to our panelists. And we look forward to our wrap up with Dr. Jones. Thank you.